Honored guests, with a great pleasure we are welcoming you to Skopje Economic and Finance Forum and the first annual conference of the Ministry of Finance, Recovery and Growth Beyond COVID. For the official opening, we are inviting on the stage the host of the conference under whose initiative this gathering came to life. To welcome you to the Skopje Economic and Finance Forum 2021. And it is my great pleasure to see you all here today at this uh, first annual conference of the Ministry of Finance to deal with the issue about economic recovery and growth beyond COVID. And our ambition remains this uh, debate is to become an arena of policy debate and credible economic policy and reform agenda design. Skopje Economic Forum is a new initiative by the Ministry of Finance aiming to facilitate the public policy debates on relevant topics of the Republic of North Macedonia and the Southeastern Europe. Through uh, annual conferences like this today, occasional seminars, workshop, policy portals, op-eds, analysis and other contributions from experts here and uh, worldwide. Its intention is to encourage the synergy of ideas and initiatives by policymakers, policy, political representatives, international development partners, civil society, academics, and other experts and stakeholders to improve the policy dialogue on economic and financial topics with the national and regional uh, outreach. The annual conference is the first event organized on the auspices of Skopje Economic Finance Forum. The conference aims at improving the policy coherence and strengthening the budget planning process. It is organized in September in order to contribute to the budget planning process and economic reform program, as well as National Investment Committee. Its policy recommendations and valuable insights will serve as an important input into policy formulation and uh, the next year to be introduced uh, for the budget planning and also in medium term for economic reform program. It will initiate constructive ideas, policy recommendations and applicable in regional context as well. The participants on the conference will have a unique opportunity to discuss and design the macroeconomic policies, public finance and structural reforms, private capital mobilization, enhanced regional and cooperation and so on. The conference will provide a high-level forum for exchanging views on the global and regional prospects for uh, post-pandemic recovery and growth, thus assisting sound macroeconomic policies, good governance and citizen participation. An appropriate and timely well-targeted support for social inclusion, digitization, green economy and human capital formation would also enhance the resilience uh, post-pandemic times to help our prosperity. And the decision to organize this conference, high-level conference, that I'm impressed and want to thank once again uh, this list of impressive representatives worldwide in the country and the region. Not only the quality, but also the diversity. This enriches the debate that we are expecting from this conference. The inclusion is in, of particular importance in creating future policies and measures to reach better results in achieving the goals like economic recovery, inclusive, accelerated, and sustainable growth. At the same time, this conference will be a great opportunity for all of us to hear the experiences and views from the region and worldwide, as those of the representatives of the international development and financial institution. Dear guests, uh, what makes this conference unique and specific at this time? It comes in times of COVID pandemic the largest health and economic crisis of the century. 
As we know, globally, as humanity faced big losses, losses of lives, we lost many people that we are close to them. Due to the COVID, some of our friends and relatives are not, and colleagues are not among us today. Others lost their jobs. The vulnerable, vulnerables uh, had uh, more difficulties. Investment stopped, and many businesses were closed, devastating the perspective. And we are here today, dear friends, to say that we are not going to be defeated by COVID. We are part of the Alliance, Global Alliance, to fight COVID. And here today, we are to talk about recovery, and not just that. We are here to talk more about recovery more than recovery, to talk about growth and better growth, green growth, accelerated growth, inclusive and sustainable growth. As last year, we were facing the, the biggest GDP decline for our country in the last three decades. We envisaged, envisaged a 4.5% decline of GDP in 2020. And according to our estimation, this could have been even higher. About 4.2 percentage points, we managed uh, to, uh, to, uh, to alleviate and to reduce the decline. So instead of this, it could have been 8.7. And we spent around 11 percent of our GDP as a fiscal stimulus to support the economy, health sector, protecting jobs, and help the economy to, to recover, to save the, the businesses, but also to recover the economy. Measures were addressed, as I mentioned, the health sector, vulnerable citizens, protecting jobs, and helping businesses to survive this crisis. And actually, we were acting both on the demand and the supply side, as the academics will say. In 2021, uh, we continued with two additional packages, uh, which were more targeted measures and adding a development component, including investments and increasing the number of employees in order recovery to turn into growth. And our response during all this period was following those inter of international institutions who said, whatever it takes policy to fight COVID, protect lives and save the economy. This came with big fiscal bill in terms of the budget balance and public debt. Decisively, we are focused on fiscal consolidation in the midterm by reducing budget deficit and public debt and bringing them within the fiscal rules of 3% and 60% as a share of GDP, respectively, in medium term. We learn from the past. We act in present, and we prepare for our future. In line with this ambition, as mentioned before, we are projecting a growth of 4.1% for 2021, and also an average growth of 5.4% in the annual average growth for the next five years. Also, to make sure that this will not remain just a wish, we have prepared an economic recovery and growth accelerating fin financing plan. The plan aims to finance the recovery of the economy affected by COVID-19 and to support an accelerated sustainable grow growth while maintaining the fiscal sustainability by mobilizing capital from the private sector in addition to the funds allocated from the budget and borrowings. Dear ladies and gentlemen, today we are having, uh, and tomorrow for this conference, we'll have six panels, as we have in the agenda, talking about global and regional challenges and prospects of recovery and growth, macroeconomic policies and public finances in post-pandemic times, good governance and social cohesion, public and private investments and competitiveness, smart and green economy, human capital, and inclusive growth. And it is important to focus not only on the policies that we provide uh, will provide strong impetus for recovery and growth acceleration, but also on resilience in the context of new challenges, of the new normal. The policy recommendation would emphasize the need for evidence-based, coherent and comprehensive policy making, followed by continuous monitoring and throughout policy evaluation. And we hope and expect that this first annual conference that we are witnessing today and contributing will envisage to grow, as mentioned earlier, as a respectable uh, traditional avenue for open policy debate. Dear participants, you here in the room and also those uh, that are following us online. Now, it is my great honor to invite the Prime Minister of the Government of North Macedonia, Mr. Zoran Zaev, to open the conference. Dear Prime Minister, the floor is yours.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, dear ministries, friends, associates, representatives of the media, it is a great honor and pleasure to give the introductory speech of the first annual conference, Economic Recovery and Growth Beyond COVID within the Skopje Economic Finance Forum. I welcome this initiative of the Ministry of Finance to organize this very important forum that undoubtedly opens a debate for the future challenges that we have ahead of us as uh, holders of policies in the Republic of North Macedonia and Southeast Europe. It is an honor that today we are all here, creators of policies, representatives of our partners from the international institutions, representatives of the civil sector, academic community, the business sector, and all other stakeholders that can act for the improvement of the policy dialogue for economic and financial topics that are of national and regional interest. The same as all other countries in the world, economy in the Republic of North Macedonia suffered from the pandemic and the government for the whole uh, duration of the pandemic uh, faced the challenges proactively uh, all the challenges brought by COVID, the government creates favorable business climate and equal opportunities for the domestic and foreign investors. The national economy is stable and it is growing and it will grow in the future. I'm proud that North Macedonia accomplished a concrete agreement with uh, Greece and Bulgaria and today we are NATO member members, which means security for our country and for the current and future investors. Our country fulfilled all conditions for the beginning of the negotiations for the chapters and clusters for membership in the European Union, which is undoubtedly confirmed by the European Commission and also by the majority uh, for, from all uh, uh, member countries uh, last year in March. We are dedicated, we remain dedicated uh, to raise the standard of life in, the, in our country, our efforts uh, for creation of uh, predictable climate in the businesses uh, through mechanisms for the rule of law, stable economic policies, as well as creation of favorable uh, uh, business conditions, the new investments in the country and the results that we see confirm the economic activity in the technological and development zones that are ever growing, the number of jobs only in the uh, uh, these zones has increased in 8% compared to July last year. Um, at this moment, we have 14,000 people working in these zones, uh, and this tendency is expected to grow in the future months, according to the contracts, agreements that we have with the current investors, and we are expecting uh, new 7,000 jobs. Uh, export in the first seven months of the year in the, the technology zones is 1 billion 700,000 euros, which is for 56% more uh, compared to the period last year, of over 9% compared to 2019, and almost 30% more compared to 2018. Only in July, export is t uh, 20. Uh, 250,000 uh, euros. So the companies active in the zones participate with over 45% in the overall exports of the country. These positive tendencies are the result of the new concept for attraction of in investments in the technological and development zones and the government uh, that uh, works uh, according to analysis uh, based on which we estimate the capacity of a company, the investments itself, and as a government, that is how we prepare individualized uh, packages for uh, stimulation and participation by the country. Dear guests, after one year, According to the official statistical data that we have available, we can say that the crisis 
uh, is passing us and the economy is recovering, uh, which is confirmed through our analysis that the economy is stable and it will grow. Officially, uh, for, uh, several moments ago, the uh, Authority for Statistics uh, published this information. In um, the second quarter of the year, we have registered positive growth of the GDP in the amount of 13.1%. This means that the first half of this year we have achieved growth of the GDP for 5.6 percent. For this year we projected the growth of 4.1 percent the whole 2021, uh, expecting for exports to grow 6 percent, uh, uh, gross investments uh, growth of 8 percent, the rate of unemployment until the end of 2020 uh, and until today started to grow uh, with the rate uh, the, the, uh, the rate of employment from the end of 2020 again started to grow with the rate as it was before the pandemic, 1.5% uh, growth in the uh, first three quarters. Uh, unemployment is 15.9%, which is historically lowest level of unemployment uh, up until today, and it has reduced for 8% uh, percent compared to the same period uh, from 2020. Additionally, according to the official statistical data, the average net salary in the country continuously grows and uh, per employee in June 2021 uh, is 28,744 dinners. The mass immunization and recovering of the global economy, we are expecting additional strengthening of the external demand which influences our export. I use this opportunity to extend gratitude for the support, uh, financial support, material support, and also with the expertise and knowledge provided by you, representatives of international financial institutions, as well as the other participants uh, and stakeholders in the past period. This event today is a confirmation for our partnership and friendship, for our future cooperation ex and exchange of experience, and uh, despite all obstacles, objective and subjective uh, challenges, Republic of North Macedonia is dedicated and is uh, determined on its uh, way for Europeanization. The process for accession to the European Union uh, demands preparation to participate on uh, 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 the single market in the European Union. Having that in consideration, we have uh, planned for concrete activities for the for freedoms of the European Union, and we add digital investment, innovation, and industrial pillar. For us, as a country, strengthening of regional cooperation is a very important objective because we see that it provides fast effects for improvement of economic performances. Of course, uh, that we need uh, to see improvement of the competitiveness of uh, the Macedonian economy through structural uh, changes, smart specializations, improved skills through better education, research and innovation, and involving in the existing and creation of a new industrial um, structures and uh, promotion of green development and transition. Uh, these are the great tasks that we have ahead of us for the mid-term and long-term period. The governmental economic team has continuously worked on preparation of plans for the future uh, mid-term development of the country and in that context the intervention uh, plan for investments 2021-2027 covers all investments that uh, uh, we are planning to initiate in the country including private investments of domestic and foreign investors. It is a strategic document with defined elements as the value of investments, key investment area, areas, investment approaches, and so on. Uh, as a complementary plan to this intervention plan for investments 2021-2027, we have prepared uh, the uh, plan for recovery and uh, funding of uh, accelerated development. The basic objective of this plan is to fund the recovery of the economy from COVID-19 and to support the accelerated sustainable development and at the same time um, uh, keeping the fiscal stability through mobilization of capital from the private sector as addition to the budget funds uh, allocated. Um, 
the plan also provides a complete image about the approach creation of uh, legal opportunities to implement this and also the plan uh, contains multi applicative effects uh, that uh, will be provided by investments uh, showed uh, in, in, in the uh, sources of funding, the economic uh, areas, and started uh, uh, and planned projects. Also, the plan defines a roadmap action plan for implementation of the activities, uh, completing the existing timeline uh, and starting new project. In addition to this, the plan also defines a precise established uh, governmental structure of units and uh, distribution of uh, duties that would lead to successful implementation. For the first time, we can say that we have established a delivery unit uh, monitoring unit and team up uh, through which we will have timely and overall insight of the priorities, the realization, uh, weaknesses, obstacles, and urgent tasks. I honestly believe that this is the way how we can overcome institutional weaknesses and to strengthen our capacities. Dear guests, pan the pandemic showed us that it is inevitable to uh, that uh, governments, society, companies need to unite to adapt to the new reality and to design policies that will focus on building equality, inclusiveness, and sustainability of economies. Uh, what we have uh, in front of us is uh, to improve the business investment climate, to be uh, resilient to the shocks, uh, turn to green uh, um, investments and digitalization, strengthening the health and educational uh, system as a basis for the human capital, strengthening of the national and institutional capacities, and also sustaining fiscal consolidation. This important event today, I uh, see it as one step forward for improvement uh, and promotion of the policies based on evidence and research that are of vital importance for the government and uh, which should uh, need uh, we need which need to be applica applicative for applicative for all governments. We expect for uh, many more uh, um, experiences like this. Uh, again, I welcome the efforts. I greet the efforts of the Minister of Finance for organization of this international conference, and I wish that it uh, should. Uh, uh, put the bedrock and to be a uh, future tradition with strong uh, uh, influence in the region and Europe. I wish you fruitful work uh, these two days of, on this first conference. It is now the time to move to the first panel debate for today. Please welcome our first moderator, Dr. Walter Defa. Economic Policy Advisor for the Prime Minister's Office. Excellencies. Tanderor. Tanderor, Excellenza. Zonia de Zotri. Um, So, in order to complete the panel here, I would like to invite all the panelists here in the room to join us here on stage. Please come and join us. Okay, now we are settled, and I see also uh, that the video links are established. So this panel is about uh, the global and the regional challenges and prospects for recovery and growth. It's very much looking at the broad picture. So it's... Um, because we have all these uh, panels that later on will go deeper and look at specific issues. 
So of course it will be about the economy, but we will also focus on society as a large. We will look at security aspects, you name it. Of course we will focus on North Macedonia, but as the pandemic is global, we will also have to look at regional, at European. In order to uh, leave enough time for substantial discussion afterwards, um, we will have to limit your statements uh, to maximum six minutes. So please stick to it. You have a timer in front of you. And uh, as they say, in the unlikely event that anybody goes beyond, I will give you a signal uh, um, with this yellow card. There is no red card. Um, okay, and I think that's the moment so that we can now actually ask, without any ado, the Vice President of the World Bank for Europe and Central Asia, Ms. Anna Gerde, who joins us through a video link. Please give your statement. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Mr. Prime Minister, Ministers of Government, members of international organizations, think tanks. I would like to congratulate the authorities of North Macedonia for initiating this event and I look forward to being with you in person in future events. I have been asked to speak about global and regional challenges and prospects for recovery and growth. Let me start by recalling that 2020 was indeed an exceptionally challenging year worldwide. Testing resilience and ability to adjust and adapt quickly and with significant surrounding uncertainty. The pandemic had a severe impact with the global economy estimated to have contracted by 4.3% last year. This is the deepest economic recession since World War II. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the World Bank has been working with governments around the world to help tackle the wide ranging impacts of the pandemic. Our primary goal has been to help save lives and livelihoods. In the Europe and Central Asia region, we have committed more than $1.7 billion to help emerging economies in the region address the immediate health emergency, increase health system capacity, support poor and vulnerable people, bolster businesses, and procure and deploy vaccines. Since April 2020, around $866 million has been approved through new emergency response projects, with an additional $904 million being reallocated used or made available from existing projects and lending. Now let me turn to the road ahead. The outlook for 2021 is looking better overall. In June, the World Bank published its Global Economic Outlook Report, where we estimated the global economy would expand by about 5.6% in 2021. In the report, we also presented scenarios for the global economy in 2021. In addition to the scenario under which we would see the global GDP growth of 5.6%, we also presented a less optimistic scenario. Indeed, the 5.6% growth scenario assumes that vaccination rates accelerate and that governments at the same time undertake key reforms that encourage investment and job creation. The less optimistic scenario assumes a slower vaccination rate and the emergence of new variants that would threaten recovery. We are currently revisiting our projections, including for the Western Balkans. There are several factors that drive a favorable economic outlook, including commodity prices and external demand, which have been stronger than anticipated, driven by a robust... 
nga forumi <coughs> dhe në vitet më rëzim për fshinë në zonën e, me euros. Për pas të këtyre, këtyre kontrakcioneve në këtë zonë dhe në sistemi nga fi. Duke thënë këtë, ato që kemi zbuluar që ka një parashikim të që parvinte në ko, poses considerable risk to recovery, including a resumption of market volatility, as markets are sensitive to negative developments. Many countries, including in the Western Balkans, enjoyed a much needed rebound in tourism over the summer. But this is also a sector that remains highly sensitive to recent increases of their Delta variant and the potential for new restrictions to movement. Let me use my time to speak what we see as some of the key challenges and opportunities for recovery and growth. On the challenging side, clearly, a key issue is to get the world's population vaccinated. This requires globally coordinated efforts, particularly in low-income countries. We keep hearing it, and it's right. The pandemic will not end until everyone has access to vaccines, including people in developing countries. Worldwide access to vaccines offers the absolute best hope for arresting the pandemic, saving lives, and securing a broad-based economic recovery. The World Bank is working closely with the IMF, the WHO, and WTO to convene international support for stepped-up financing to ensure more equitable access to vaccines. Qeveriet, kompanit farmaceutike, përfaqësus, kompanit të prokurimeve ndimojnë për të ndimojnë njërëzit në përgjithsi për të dhe për, për të përminsuar në opcionet për vaksinim në shtetet të ndryshme. A second challenge, and it was mentioned by His Excellency, the Prime Minister, is the fact that fiscal space has narrowed and public debt has reached some new historical peaks. This is the case for several Western Balkan countries. And what we see and worry about is that servicing such debt in the future may crowd out important public sector priorities. A third challenge is knowing when to withdraw the fiscal and monetary policy support that was extended and implemented in 2020 and the first half of 2021. The pandemic has certainly increased the role of the state in many parts of the world, including in Europe and Central Asia. This has often been warranted given the once in a century phenomenon of this global pandemic. As such, premature withdrawal can be risky, but we believe sustainable economic recovery will require that the private sector and private financing plays a larger role going forward, as will pursuing rigorous reform agendas. A fourth challenge in an area we monitor carefully is inflation, both globally and at the national level. The question is whether rising inflation that we're seeing is a temporary phenomenon or a longer term development. If inflation proves not to be temporary, further tightening of monetary policy might be required. This in turn could lead to deterioration in conditions for financing, which could affect many emerging markets in developing countries around the world. But the pandemic reminds us not only about challenges we face as a global community, but also the opportunities. That is why the World Bank is working closely with countries around the world, including in the Western Balkans, to help ensure a sustainable, resilient, and uh, inclusive recovery. Let me mention a few areas where we see significant opportunities. First, we should focus on building back in a way that tackles global challenges such as climate change, extreme poverty, and social inequality. A resilient recovery requires actions and policies that benefit both people and the planet, and which put green growth at the center of development goals. This would involve accelerating the energy transitions and decarbonization that can attract investment, improve quality of life, and people's health by cutting pollution and reducing healthcare costs. Further, investments in health and education can create jobs and opportunities, improve people's lives, and boost growth and productivity. The pandemic has highlighted that healthcare systems in many countries were unequipped and understaffed. We believe that digitization provides many opportunities to achieve sustained and inclusive health and education outcomes. 
I'm glad to see that the World Bank program in North Macedonia includes support to the reform of education, health and social assistance systems, and is supporting the preparation of a human capital development strategy. We also urge countries across the Western Balkans to boost investment in and by the private sector and pursue key reforms that strengthen government institutions, the judiciary, and the business environment. Such reforms are critical for growth and poverty reduction, as well as for faster accession into the EU. Finally, as the crisis subsides, countries will need to rebuild fiscal buffers to safeguard macroeconomic stability. In closing, we, while we see signs of global recovery, the pandemic continues to threaten with major health, social, and economic impacts around the world, and especially in developing countries, and, and, and its ability to reverse important gains over the past decade in reducing poverty and inequality. At the World Bank, we remain a committed partner to the countries in Europe and Central Asia as they chart a path forward out of the pandemic and toward a brighter and more promising future for all their people. We look forward to participating in several of the discussions over the next two days to support North Macedonia chart its path. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Bierde, for this uh, very complete coverage. Uh, I uh, now turn to the uh, first Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Political System and Relations between Communities, Artan Gruby. How do you see the situation? Thank you. Thank you so very much. Dear host, Fatmir, thank you so very much for the invitation to attend and speak before this distinguished forum and congratulations on organizing such a respectable conference in these difficult and challenging times. Dear Prime Minister, Zoran Zaev, dear ministers, dear guest ambassadors, dear governor, dear academic, dear former ministers of finance particularly, dear panelists, my Linda, good to see you here. So I am honored, honestly, to be here today and share this panel with you on this very important topic. Indeed, uh, beside the public health, COVID pandemic has also seriously challenged all our economies and has imposed the necessity to discuss ways and solutions for economic recovery and growth post-COVID. However, I want to tackle a different angle. I want to tackle and talk about the 5% or maybe the 10%, or maybe perhaps 15, 20% commission. I'm addressing this issue because the pandemic is temporary. It will go away eventually. Whereas the permanent and immediate threat to the growth of all of our economies and our societies is corruption, my dear friends. That then would lead to substituting, just a second, because probably they missed my speech. Developments, sorry, developments main and true enemy is corruption. Corruption, dear ladies and gentlemen, hampers our growth in so many ways and it represents a security threat to our democracy. It undermines the credibility of the institutions and the processes. Even reading the economy for dummies says that there cannot be economic development without the rule of law. Then again, without sustainable rule of law, we can't have credible institutions and gain the trust of the public towards the system. Not having credible institutions and missing public trust prevents essential legal predictability, which then leads to selective and corruptive justice. Once you have corruptive justice, you have reluctance of investments, production, and building and business climate. That then leads to substituting the corruptive justice system through the easiest way to get the job done, and that would be bribe, fraud, corruption. So yes, COVID, Afghanistan, Middle East, financial crisis, China, Russia, 5G regimes, all are serious challenges that we are facing, but they all find roots in endemic corruption, 
and they all represent a viable option only because of existing corruption. An estimate that I read is that 120 billion euros were lost each year to corruption in the member states of the European Union. That used to be, was equivalent of the whole European Union budget. In public procurement, studies suggest that up to 15 to 20 percent, uh, sorry, 20 to 25 percent of the public contracts value may be lost to corruption. Therefore, start reporting cases of corruption today. No propaganda, no party groundless accusations, just real, factual, argumented cases. Build, and let's build, a coalition of the willing, government, non-government, business, academia, media, all must unite and stand against corruption. Corruption must be addressed at schools, media, family, as it is a worse virus than COVID in terms of economic recovery and growth. This would be a starting point to build the culture of institutional and personal integrity as well as, a, as well as an ethical conduct of individuals as well as institutions. Whereas the starting foundation and point of economic recovery in our country as well as the region is fight against organized crime and corruption as well as rule of law, period. Thank you. Thank you very much. But Thank you for this very clear plea to continue and to step up the fight against corruption and for the rule of law. Now we turn to the representative of uh, UNDP, uh, Mr. Hayo Liang Xu, Assistant Secretary, Assistant Administrator and Director of the Bureau of Policy and Program Support. Mr. Xu, please come in. Thank you. I uh, hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tafa. Uh, dear Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Minister of uh, Finance, Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to uh, attend uh, this uh, conference and to say a few words on behalf of uh, UNDP. I uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizers to invite UNDP to speak. Uh, we are at uh, extraordinary times, and we face at the same time uh, we face at the same time uh, a pandemic, a climate emergency, political polarization, continued conflicts, natural disasters, and the widespread humanitarian needs, multiple challenges. And uh, but the pandemic is uh, our focus. So. Uh, the previous speakers uh, have mentioned the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, the pandemic. Let me provide uh, some uh, perspective from our side. The pandemic not only disrupted the global supply chains and slowed down the world economy, but has also caused a severe reversal in well-being. The socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 has been felt in every corner of the world by people from all walks of life. For the first time since we started to measure human development in 1990, the Human Develop Development Index has dropped across the globe. Income, education, and the longevity indicators have all dropped during the COVID-19 crisis. Some will rebound, but the effects will linger on for a long time to come. And uh, according to I uh, ILO data, between 119 to 124 million people were pushed, uh, uh, based on our research, between 119 and 124 million people were pushed back into extreme poverty. And according to ILO, uh, the equivalent of 255 million full-time jobs were lost since March 2020. And there are more data from UNICEF on education and so forth the impact is on human development is severe. So what can be done? 
And the Prime Minister, in fact, talked about the measures that most, uh, Macedonia has taken. And the World Bank Vice President also pointed out uh, some specific measures. We have a, a lot of data and analysis that show that economies that could afford to provide universal social assistance, generous social insurance, and adequate labor market and SME support, for example, in the forms of tax deferrals, subsidies, and the liquidity support, have done so with remarkable mitigating effects, largely neutralizing income losses, job losses, and the poverty increases. However, most of the developing countries have not been able to you know, afford this full mitigation. And uh, as IMF you know, a policy tracker shows that the global amount of support reached the $17.3 trillion in July 2021, 11.2 trillion of which uh, was for fiscal support and 6.1 trillion was for liquidity and the guarantees. However, while advanced economies managed 17.3% of GDP in fiscal support and 11.4% of GDP in liquidity and guarantees, this equivalent figures for emerging markets is only 4.1% and 2.6% of GDP respectively. And for low-income countries, it's only 2% and 0.2% of GDP equivalent. So this is the, the, the issue of fiscal space that the Vice President of the World Bank talked about earlier. So on emergency social uh, protection measures, the higher income countries have allocated on average $545 per person in social assistance. Low and middle income countries can only afford $26 per person. And for low-income countries alone, it's only four dollars per person. So we see the challenges across different you know, spectrums of you know uh, countries. You know, uh, so we needed to do some. So we know uh, what needs to be done, but we needed to deal with with uh, for policy choices, right, the timing of it, and so forth. So, what are the pro prospects? Again, the previous speaker has talked about it. The IMF, you know, uh, project a 46% global growth. Uh, that has not changed from previous uh, projection, but we see a divergence because the IMF, you know, uh, projection projected an increase and up upgrade for advanced economies, while projected a decrease for developing countries, especially for uh, Asian developing countries. So I think that this is a, a divergence that we need to pay attention to. Why? partly because of vaccine in inequity. Again, uh, the Vice President of the World Bank talked about. But to move forward, we must address vaccine equity. To date, more than five more than 5.3 billion shots, you know, have been administered across uh, the world. That an average of 69 per 100 people. But the dozens of poor countries remain below five shots per 100 people. So these are the countries that will only reach 70% vaccine coverage by 2023. So this will threaten global economic recovery elsewhere. So vaccine equity is uh, our number one priority to get things back on track. So this is also a time a moment to consider how we uh, recover from COVID and how we can come out of this crisis by doing things differently. It will take all of our efforts to work together with a systems approach to deal with the new levels of complexities and uncertainties. So it is really recommendable to see that North Macedonia is pioneering with applying a systems transformation approach to the development of the first long-term national development strategy, use the so-called donut economic model in the creation of a living strategy with an evolving process that will ensure that the NDS will be as effective in 20 years. The systems approach 
will address interconnected vulnerabilities by building horizontal and vertical capabilities across the society, guaranteeing safe and just space for the people of Macedonia. The Deputy Prime Minister talked about the issue of corruption. It is a part of this discussion that requires societal commitment and consensus. So I congratulate you, Mr. Prime Minister, on your commitment to engage in a whole of society approach to drafting the country's national development strategy. And the UNDP is most pleased to accompany you through this process. And thank you very much for your trust. To close, let me quote what the Secretary General has said recently. The UN Secretary General said, we are truly at a crossroads with consequential choices before us. So let us together to make the choices right and create the desired sustainable future for us and for our future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much attention more and more on the inequalities that have increased uh, uh, during uh, the crisis and that remain a big challenge. Minister of Defense. Radmila Shekarinska, I would like to invite you just to share your views uh, on the way through and out of the crisis. Well, thank you very much. And uh, surprisingly, I will actually uh, follow on some of the comments made uh, by our panel co-panel co uh, co speaker. Uh, first, let me start by thanking the Minister of Finance, the Prime Minister, and saying uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, if uh, 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 an economist uh, who left this world 10 years ago would have visited us during the post-COVID uh, recovery, probably he or she would be shocked, uh, infuriated, and very, very angry at most of the things that the world has done. Uh, but I think that the COVID pandemics has shown that the world can be very creative, very quick in adapting, and very good at cooperation during the times of existential crisis. And my first appeal would be that we need the same creativity and the same cooperation to tackle the post-COVID world. Uh, as the popular, popular saying goes, uh, we should never waste a good crisis. And uh, I think, uh, unlike some of the other financial crises, this is the moment when most of the economists and politicians agree that what we continue to mention for our social habits, return to normalcy, is not really an option when it comes to policy, politics, and especially the economy. And the appeal uh, that was first uh, formulated in the US as build back uh, better, or very, very visible in the EU recovery plans, I think this should be the ambition even for countries like North Macedonia. So. Uh, uh, the perception of the majority of the citizens in the many countries is that the normal has been broken. And this is why actually most of our political and economic choices have to aim for something better. And uh, in my mind, there is quite a, a substantive and ambitious list on this. And the first one is what was already mentioned. And this is gener uh, generate a less unequal world. Uh, then uh, deal with uh, create economy that will be less carbonated, uh, build modern public infrastructure, uh, universal health care, uh, create coordinated rules on digital era. Uh, and uh, in spite of our main effort being directed towards fighting climate change, we should, we should also plan for the effect that the climate change is already having on us. Look at the wildfires, look at the, the floods, this requires a general overall of all our systems, starting from security, but going to, to various uh, parts. And uh, I, I do think that uh, practically the option of doing everything the old way is not, no longer on the table. Uh, we have seen how the governments can pour money into the economy. Probably with post-COVID, we will have to maintain this effort, not only into the economy, but also in public, hopefully, infrastructure. But when giving this money and practically allowing for the economy, economy to grow, I think that our political priorities, civilizational priorities have to, come, have to become more visible. 
And I do believe that uh, there will be a missed opportunity if we don't combine strong subsidies that we have given and will give to companies with more social responsibility in terms of uh, environment, in terms of uh, better, better uh, social models, and use them as part of our budget policy to rethink tax systems, rethink income uh, policies, rethink some of the uh, anti-poverty uh, 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 theories. Uh, I don't believe that this is just the right thing to do. I do believe that this is the smart thing to do. And uh, on mentioning the arguments in favor of this, I will go back to my domain, and this is defense. Last year, North Macedonia has become the 30th member of the alliance. It was a major historical su success for this young nation. And success is always helpful for the economy, even in times of crisis. So it helped a bit to compensate for the lost trust uh, in terms of future consumption, in terms of future investments. It was visible in all of the credit rating uh, assessments for North Macedonia. It was visible even in the behavior of some of the private uh, and uh, uh, public investors. Uh, but uh, when we have discussed last year the new key reform agenda for NATO, we have talked very much about resilience. And this is, this is how I see this change, as preparing us for more resilient societies. Our societies, uh, according to, to some of the assessments by the Munich Security Conference, uh, are not so overwhelmed with the threat of uh, great power competition only, or other issues which are very visible in the arena, but by what happens within our societies. The rise of illiberalism, instability in the Western, let's say, identity. And in order to fight these trends, we need to uh, make our societies, not only our institutions, more resilient. If we don't tackle the roots of this instability, uh, I do believe that most of the things that we are doing, even in the defense sector, uh, will not be sufficient. And this is why uh, my appeal would be yes to fighting inequality, yes to fighting corruption, yes to reassessing practically all of the rules that were typical of you know, our system two years ago. But let us be more creative and let us look at the big picture all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The new normal um, will not be the old normal, but should even be a better normal uh, in the future. So thank you very much for this, also for the insight on the security front. Um, Her Excellency, Ms. Kate uh, Mary Burns, Ambassador of the United States. How do you see the, the challenges, but also maybe opportunities? Thank you very much, uh, dear Prime Minister, dear Minister of the Government, distinguished guests. I too want to start by congratulating the Government of North Macedonia and the Ministry of Finance in particular for not only organizing uh, this platform, uh, but creating an opportunity for us to start a new conversation about how we can learn from each other and help build uh, the kind of economic recovery that we would like to see coming out of COVID-19. Um, Minister Shekarinska talked about not wasting a good crisis. And there's an old adage that says that in every crisis lies great opportunity. And indeed, Walter, I would like to talk about opportunity today. You know, we've never had a, a crisis of this magnitude as a global community that we faced as we have over the past year and a half. And um, it has changed the global economy in ways that no one could ever have imagined. That's as true in the United States as it is here in Europe and everywhere else around the world. Um, one of the things that we saw from the very beginning was a huge shift um, in supply chains as global manufacturing slowed to a halt and importers lost access to some of the vital products that we'd all depend on as consumers and as countries and governments around the world. What we saw was that supply chains then shifted. They often moved closer to the areas where products were going to be sold on markets. Um, and this has, in fact, been a boon for North Macedonia, uh, as well as its US partners here, with several companies expanding their existing facilities and others deciding to establish themselves here with new footholds in order to be closer to their markets. 
We saw that U.S. automotive companies, which represent over $200 million in total investments and over 10,000 good-paying jobs here in North Macedonia, have increased their investments in this country. Lear, for instance, is expanding its production capacity and it plans to add more than 1,000 employees in 2022. Digitalization and e-commerce is also expanding here at a very rapid pace. Though COVID has present, prevented the kind of in-person exchanges that we had grown to depend on so routinely in the past, the tech companies that are operating here in North Macedonia have found ways to ensure that people can continue to conduct business and to go about their lives even more safely. Food delivery companies, for example, quickly added contact list delivery options and they expanded their list of partners which has helped keep many restaurants and other hospitality sector industries afloat during this difficult time. U.S. tech companies set up or shop here for the first time or expanded their efforts in North Macedonia, taking advantage of the very talented workforce that's available here and are now offering remote services in the United States. As government, business, civil society, and citizens navigate the economic recovery, we need to focus in focus on strengthening and in some cases building anew the very foundations upon which this future economy will stand. While many large companies are able to maneuver through bureaucracies uh, and make very significant investments here in North Macedonia, we do find that smaller companies find the business environment difficult. So ensuring that procurement processes are transparent reducing both the perception and the problems of corruption, strengthening rule of law, um, and importantly, establishing a professional bureaucracy that's able to work with companies on routine issues will all improve the overall business environment and it will attract additional foreign direct investment not only to North Macedonia but throughout the region. And speaking of the region, supporting the common regional market will reduce trade friction, it'll harmonize standards, and it'll make travel easier, not just for the citizens of this region, but for all of its global customers uh, and partners uh, around the world. North Macedonia is working hard to complete the motorways and railways along quarters 8 and quarter 10. Uh, and this will be another boon, again for North Macedonia, but also for the region. By building out transportation infrastructures, consumers gain access to cheaper products and businesses can gain access to bigger markets. Many tech companies have found success in North Macedonia as well. Reducing restrictions and administrative burdens in this sector could lead to even greater innovation, jobs, and prosperity. Moreover, advocating for this country's youth to pursue careers in STEM fields um, is not only going to help create a modern workforce here, but it will ensure that North Macedonia can take advantage of the changes that are happening all around and generate long-term economic growth. We need to encourage the country's youth not just to be present here in North Macedonia, but to be active participants in the recovery and to help capture those opportunities for themselves. This country has proven that it has the necessary will to take advantage of these changes. We should not forget that even in the earliest days of the pandemic here, with supplies running short, North Macedonia's clothing companies quickly um, quickly moved to rapidly begin mass production while distillers here started producing disinfectants. The NGOs in country used international donations to provide meals and sanitation kits to the most vulnerable groups throughout the country and the government moved very swiftly to implement, implement wide-ranging economic stimulus measures that protected jobs and supported unemployed workers. Your economy can adapt and, as it's shown, even thrive when challenged. So in short, the will and the energy is here um, to not only come out of this crisis in a strong way, but to lay the foundations for the kind of economy moving forward that will provide a great opportunity for citizens. And the United States plans to continue to co-invest in that success because your success is important to our broader strategic partnership. So once again, thank you. I'm very much looking forward to the ideas and the synergies that this forum will generate, not only over the next couple of days, but moving forward into the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador, for putting so much emphasis on the opportunities and also on improving the business environment, in particular for small businesses. 
So now we change a bit the subject, uh, um, and uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister has already said in uh, his speech how important regional cooperation is, and in particular in this crisis. So it's great that we have here the Secretary General of the, the Regional Cooperation Council, Marina Brego, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. Uh, dear Minister, dear Fatmir, thank you for inviting me here. Dear Prime Minister, dear Artan, distinguished uh, guest. Uh, I left North Macedonia last July, to the 2nd of July, when we had the opportunity to participate at the PRESPA Forum, and then we marked together with the Prime Minister Zayev the very first day of the roaming free regime in the region. And I closed uh, up my agenda with a gem of artists from the region and a huge group of youngsters who are eager to party uh, in uh, the premises of Prespa Lake. And that was really wonderful. Regardless, I was really tired. But anyhow, they were partying, singing, and dancing up to, let's say, 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, it's not by coincidence, but I started again my day uh, in Skopje today, meeting with the youngsters, with the youth councils of, uh, uh, of North Macedonia. Uh, and uh, I have to say uh, that while coming to the conference in here, the three of us that were uh, just arrived uh, to come here, uh, we are just talking feverishly and discussing uh, uh, that it was really a great meeting, the one that we had with youngsters. Not only because usually young people and young community and everybody you meet out of office refreshes you with some ideas, but we got from them some ideas and elements that I think would be really great to be implemented in the recovery of our region. And compliments, by the way, Fatmir, because usually I can uh, recall from the times I was minister in the government myself that the minister of finance was only known to know the price of everything but the value of nothing. So thank you for bringing us all together to see and discuss about the values uh, that might come and the value that might come out of, uh, of a crisis. Uh, I heard last days that uh, the unemployment level, uh, which is one of the biggest problems that everybody in the region uh, would really name out, the unemployment level in North Macedonia fell. And I hope that will be true uh, as well uh, for uh, the young people of uh, this region. Because as I started my, my, my intervention, they are our greatest uh, uh, asset. And they are the engine driving the regional cooperation. They are not only smart, uh, but they have that self-confidence uh, that when you are adult, you usually lose because you should speak uh, and respect politics and, and uh, business-like language. Uh, so they can, they can tell you everything that maybe you are not really able or capable uh, to, to spell out. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, that's one and a very good source because the three biggest problems in this region our homelands are unemployment, corruption, as Artan mentioned, and brain drain. And all those are issues that we need to tackle on a post-pandemic uh, recovery. But as you said, we should never waste a good crisis. Uh, well, I, this is not a good crisis, but anyhow, it's a crisis. So I have to tell that even during the crisis, we managed all together as a region uh, to give some, uh, let's say, good results and achieve, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, of uh, those uh, uh, targets that, might, that are vital for us. So we had experienced uh, an unprecedented level of cooper cooperation during the crisis. Uh, the green lanes came and entered into, fo into force because we felt the necessity to have foods goods, medicines, respirators, masks, gloves, being in the region. And you will all remember that the very first days in March time were uncertain for all the world, EU as well, others. So we felt that either we do cooperate with each other, either we keep our borders open, either we forget the disputes that exist between some of the economies of the region and keep those borders that are part of the disputes open, or then we are going to face a major crisis. It might have been like, like a hunger crisis or even, even, even worse. Uh, 
we learned that we can uh, cooperate. We have the very good example of the roaming free agreement that entered into force. And that as well is a story of success because pragmatism prevailed over political disputes. That's the sense of the regional cooperation that we are uh, trying to, to promote. Last year, November, the prime ministers, the leaders of this region signed the common regional market. And I thank you, Ambassador, for mentioning it. I'm not jealous because we are hearing more openly of the Open Balkans. But I have to say that we all know the more, the merrier. The reason why common regional market was born and endorsed by the prime ministers is because our economies are too small and we cannot face the challenges of globalization. We might not be pretty much interesting economies and countries alone, but all together, yes, we can really build a story for a good investor. Uh, this process and this agenda, which is already an ambitious one, it uh, definitely is facing some problems. So I have to say, and I've been refraining myself this month uh, uh, to uh, like uh, phrase or rephrase uh, the process of the Open Balkans that is proposed by three leaders with that of the common regional market. I have to say that uh, Six is better than three. But this does not mean that anybody at the level of six should block the agendas to run. And on that, we do and we are following carefully, quite attentively, and we do appreciate the effort put forward by the three leaders of the region to keep the process of the common regional market of Western Balkans or the single market model of EU forward not to stop it. And for us, that is a must. Whenever we face problems, citizens will not stay prone of the titles of the documents uh, uh, or the processes that, that, uh, that we are endorsing. They would like to see results. And that's why politicians are, to help their people to see results. Uh, this comes as well because 69% of the people from this uh, region see the quality of regional cooperation as quite important for, uh, for their uh, uh, business. And as I said, we know that the regional cooperation will prevail on the strength of its ideas, uh, competitiveness, but as well uh, uh, speed. Now there is another second opportunity. The opportunity that should come from the Euro-Atlantic presence cooperation in the Western Balkans. We cannot neglect that, and we have to say that every time that your Atlantic partnership was strong and great, Western Balkans have been in a better shape. And especially, I say it with a, a sudden tone, take it like, like Frank from somebody who, is, who spent more than more than 16 years of her life working on European enlargement and European integration, that I really feel the process of European enlargement being stalled, it's a huge setback for this region. It will just create hurdles, problems on the process of regional cooperation as well. That's why the process of, of enlargement was born. That's why Thessaloniki came into birth. That's why it gave a date to our association and stabilization agreements, because that date was like as a sign and an inspiration for politicians to deliver within their political mandate. What will be the sense if the European enlargement process will continue for 30 years and still we need to go publicly and say, yes, people of this region massively support the process of European enlargement. But if they support the process of European enlargement so intensively, then we should give them the chance to have Europe at home and live here, not to live as they are living one by one, becoming European citizens one by one, and then emptying our, our societies. But on the other hand, while we are just still working and hoping for that to happen, we still have the good chance of regional cooperation uh, to continue and to focus efforts at maximum on the economic integration as much as possible with the uh, EU. Said that, starting from the roaming agreement, I think we paid our dues. 
RCC coordinated, facilitated, leaders signed it, telecom operators, the most difficult part of the story, anyhow, they are delivering. Uh, everybody paid its dues in the region. We are promised the day that this agreement will enter into force in the Western Balkans, that will be the first day to start the process of negotiation, to lower the roaming prices with EU. I see the yellow one, but you are not going to stop me now. This is the best part. <laughs> so I think that day has come. And uh, we should all push together for that promise to be maintained. Uh, it's not only a matter of, of honor, but it's about a matter of economics as well. Business community is looking for that. Citizens, young people are looking for that. Secondly, the story of, uh, of the green lanes. We paid our dues. We kept our borders open among ourselves. But we are not confined only by, by ourselves. We are confined with European member states as well. So by starting the process of keeping and the piloting one at least green lane, as it was said between North Macedonia and Greece, for example, this might really build, build a very good example for, uh, for, the, rest of the, uh, for the rest of us uh, in the region. And then we can really say that, yes, we are progressing in the process of regional cooperation, unless the process, or let alone that the process of enlargement, it's taking, uh, it's taking uh, too long. And finally, coming back to where I started this morning. Uh, I have to compliment and commend North Macedonia for being a pioneer in implementation of the EU Youth Guarantee Scheme. And uh, since we got the very nice food for thought, as I said, from the youngsters, uh, I am launching from here with a good faith and hope that, uh, dear Prime Minister Zaev, uh, Fatmir, uh, I don't see Fatmir Butucci anymore in the room as well, to help us start promoting a uh, regional coalition on jobs and skills. It means that business community as well has to offer, but we need as well to support them, opportunities of trainship, internships, for the young people of the region. We can do our best, we can employ some whenever we work, but that will never be enough because business is usually, or young people are usually oriented on startups now and they do have uh, a business mind. So I think that this might be a very good example to increase as well the regional uh, mobility. We might have another chance to, to mark something important from, uh, from North uh, Macedonia. So uh, looking forward for your help and support on that. Allow me to, to end in here by as well congratulating you on the upcoming uh, important anniversary of independence uh, and uh, wishing to you all the best. Thanks a lot. Uh, slightly long, but a great plea for uh, uh, regional cooperation, uh, which is a success story, it seems, and also for taking into account more the young people. I think that's a very important and strong message. Now we kind of widen a bit the perspective. Uh, uh, we bring in an academic view, but also a lot of experience uh, from uh, executive uh, education. So uh, it's a pleasure that we have uh, Andrew White here, uh, Professor Andrew White, Associate Dean for External Relations, Said Business School, Oxford University. Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Walter. Um, and Prime Minister, <coughs> Ministers, distinguished guests, excellences, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here today at this conference. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, um, but due to various reasons, um, I hope to be there next year um, and to be with you in a face-to-face -face environment. And can I say how good it is to see everybody meeting together again after such a long time when we've all been sat at our computers and only being able to interact in that way. So first of all, I want to say thank you to the panelists. Um, I think there is so much in common um, that we are talking about. It's so good to see this conference. Congratulations to the Ministry of Finance and to Fatmir, the minister, for putting this on. I think it's a really important conference, not just for North Macedonia, but for the region and indeed for the world, for all of those who are interested in leadership and interested in, in about creating a positive and let's say constructive future, um, future world. So I want to start really by taking you back, taking you back to a conversation that I had at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2015. 
I was interviewing a number of CEOs and political leaders about how they saw the world, how they saw the future of leadership. And I'll never forget this one conversation. I was talking to a CEO and they said this, for the last 30 years, it's been as though I've been climbing a mountain. And that mountain represents me and my leadership. It represents the company I've led and it represents the industry. And today it's as though I'm stood on top of the mountain and I should feel incredibly proud of everything we've created and the positive impact we've had on the world. But if I'm really honest, what I feel is that we are surrounded by clouds. We cannot see where to go next. And it feels like the ground is crumbling beneath us. And I thought to myself, wow, that are, they are strong words. This company wasn't in crisis. Um, there wasn't a shareholder revolt. There wasn't a problem with their finances, with regulators. They weren't caught up in globalization events. But that person, I think, was seeing what we've experienced over the last two years. Wasn't seeing COVID, but was seeing the level of disruption that is affecting the world. And if I look, I want to just capture what some of the other panelists have talked about. I think what we've experienced during the COVID times is actually a warm up for what's coming later. And the question I have for you is, what does that next mountain look like? And I think there are three, three things, and they've come out this morning, that for me define that next mountain. The first one is how we adjust to the climate challenge, how we create the technologies, how we create the changes in human behavior that allow for us to create a sustainable world. The second is how do we advance the digital agenda in a way that doesn't destroy society? And I don't need to go into the reasons for that with an audience like this, but we've seen some of the negative impacts of social media. I think AI is on a really pivotal, it's at a pivotal point in history as in, is it gonna reinforce some of the bad things we've seen or is it gonna create a better future? And the third point is around the rehumanizing of society, the rehumanizing of companies. And all of these things require a lot of explanation that I don't have time to go into today, but I think many of you have got experience. Many of the panelists have talked about these things. But my real purpose of today is to talk about how do you navigate to that future? And as somebody who leads the advanced management and leadership program at Oxford, I work with hundreds of leaders every year um, from the political world, from the world of civil service, from the corporations, um, and they're all facing these disruptive challenges. So I want to give you really a, a two sets of questions that I, I have found have been incredibly useful. The first set of questions are around your situation, your context. So the first question is, what are you not discussing that you really need to talk about? And when I put this question to a senior group of leaders, often a board or an executive team, half of them will look at the floor because they all know there's very uncomfortable things they need to talk about, that it's just difficult to get on the agenda. And what I think we're seeing is there's more and more external events that are forcing those conversations onto the agenda of executive teams, onto the agendas of boardrooms, and they have to have it. But th at that point, they're in a crisis. So the first question is, what are you not discussing that you need to talk about? The second question is, what is always being discussed but never resolved? What is always being discussed but never resolved? And when I ask that question, half the group will start smiling because they all know there's things that they're always talking about and can never find a resolution to. But they need to if the organization is to move forward. And the third question is, what spaces do you need to create? And, and for me, this is a space um, or an executive team or what's the space that you need to create with the right people to have that conversation. So that's all about understanding context. The se second set of questions are about understanding the journey. And, and for me, there's four here. Firstly, what is it that you want to take with you? You know, when you look at economies, when you look at companies, to me, there's an awful lot of good that's been built. And 
it's important to preserve a lot of these things and to take them with you on that journey from today's mountain to the next mountain. But there's also things that you need to change. So the question, second question is, what do you want to leave behind? The third question is, what do you need to transform? And the fourth question is, what do you need to create? And in that final question, we're in the, the territory of startups. And that's really hard for large established companies. So that really concludes what I've got to say in six minutes. I think we're at a really pivotal point between what many of us have been involved in building over the last few decades. And that's one mountain and the mountain we have to get to which is another mountain. And that mountain is characterized by the climate shift, by the digital shift, and by the rehumanization. And we really have to understand context, have an honest conversation about that, and understand the journey. Those two sets of questions I've just described, if I'm working with a team from a company, that's two days worth of discussion. So I've crammed a lot in. I'm going to stop there. I think I'm over time. If you want to find more about my work, if you go onto LinkedIn and search for my name, Andrew White, and Leadership 2050, you'll find my blog and my newsletter. And a lot of these ideas are in there um, and you can learn more. Please do message me. Please do connect. It would be great to talk to all of you. Um, and I want to wish the minister, Fatmir, and the whole of that ministry, all the very best, and the other, other ministers who are here today um, in what you're trying to do. It's been great to be able to support you uh, during this time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Andrew, for this inspiring and uh, very innovative approach to how to deal with the disruption of the crisis. I have failed in my time management. Uh, I have to apologize, but I think it's a bit of a collective uh, uh, responsibility. So um, we still have uh, two up to now silent panelists uh, uh, here. And uh, I know, Prime Minister, you are very much under, under time pressure. So uh, I want to give you at least uh, uh, the opportunity to react briefly to what you have heard and uh, um, let you comment and also the Minister of Finance. Prime Minister, over to you. First of all, it's really great honor uh, to have two days here in the center of Skopje and to speak, spoke about uh, the future activities. I want to share with every participant that uh, since the starting the pandemic, we was aware that it's also a good time uh, to start planning, to prepare on time, because we'll be escaped from the crisis period and how much we are ready uh, will depend from us uh, how better results we will achieve, uh, comparing with competition with the rest of the countries of the region in a quality co competition. And really, I'm very happy because we share very precise economic investment plan, what is completely uh, main focus of democratic world, European Union, United States, and other uh, part of democratic world, and that is through the responsibility in the climate change plans, uh, how to, to find a way to strengthen the GDP, to open jobs, uh, to, to take out the call and to be participant in the protection of the health of the world population normally. And uh, the complete plan of economic investment idea and uh, the, the focus, it's uh, generally dedicated to the renewables normally, G digitalization, what is the main focus of the, of the whole uh, part of the world and especially democratic part of the world, but also to use the potentials and advantages of every economy, of every region, what can be used. Really, we are quite uh, best re uh, destination in the European continent, uh, not uh, more attractive, but one of the best locations for uh, photovoltaics, for windmills, here what can be our good potential for economy. But our agriculture, having in mind that the world will need more and more quality food, especially biofood, especially quality production, our uh, traditionally workforce dedicated 
to the light industries, for example, what we have it, like our advantages, and all of that, like potential, in a regional cooperation, having in mind that all six Western Balkan countries, but also other countries here in the region, some of them are members of the European Union, some of them are normally like us, candidate countries, can organize ourselves to strengthen the potential in a matter to have a better and more qualified offer from our production, from our services, in a competition with the Western Europe, with the uh, Central Europe, with the Northern Europe normally, and in this direction, I believe very much that uh, the data, what we share today, after announcement by our statistic, that 3.1% growth for the second quarter of this year and generally 56 of the first half of the year is something very motivating. For me personally, yes, and I saw how our Minister of Finance is happy because of that, because that confirms also our revenues in the budget, uh, that uh, we, we have it more than 9% better revenues comparing even with 2019, before COVID. Our export growth, all data is uh, completely encouragement, and that is legally confirmation that we are out of crisis, because after that kind of data, officially we are out of crisis. We are aware that we can continue to live with pandemia, but we learn a lot, like world, like societies normally. In this direction, I think that we can be leaders or fighting with leaders in the region, normally in an economic way. It depends normally of the uh, strengthening the capacity of the institutions. All these acts of Europeization, what's happened in the Balkans and also in North Macedonia, will be very helpful for our plans for recovery completely and to uh, better growth or will be uh, obstacles and depend of our successfulness of uh, strengthening and dependency of judiciary, what was mentioned, fight against crime and corruption. All of that mean immediately economy, immediately encouragement of domestic and foreign investment, but improving the education system. And we started first year with uh, a lot of dual education what will, in the middle period of time, will prepare more and more qualified workforce, together with the quick measures for immediate results for qualified workforce in the, in the market, uh, will be also very helpful for fulfillment of our plans. But all other areas, taking care of poor people, social measures, all of that is very important. We learn a lot from our partners. Here is high representatives of financial institutions. I, uh, I try to, to find always some more experience from them because all, they are present all around the, the world. I see here Madam Pavlova, but also I meet Vice President of ABRD. Today I will have a meeting with Linda, Regional Manager of World Bank. All other financial institutions work with us, share information. We share our information through them with uh, uh, other countries. And of course, helping each other, cooperate together, we can achieve more. Even we can double all our efforts, what we expect. And really, every crisis can be opportunity, can be possibility for all of us. And developing regions like uh, our region here can use a lot of that and can be uh, uh, can can put the, the whole region really in more advanced position comparing with the rest of the of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very rapidly because uh, we have to look at the watch uh, and in fact these are already concluding remarks. Thanks for your concluding remark, Prime Minister, and now a concluding remark uh, from the Minister uh, of Finance. Thank you, uh, thank you Defa, uh, for moderating. Uh, excellent. And you still are within the time frame, so congratulations. Well, <laughs> at high cost. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I will not try to, to conclude. As, as you know, we 
uh, the design of the conferences we have here for this panel, Academic Bejeti, who will take, uh, who will make a, a review tomorrow uh, at the last yeah. panel. So in each panel we have those who will do conclusions, insights from the discussion. So thank you for the opportunity just to, to thank the, uh, the panelists. And also what I want to share at this moment uh, about the crisis, talking about the opportunities is the right thing, but also talking about the lessons. And what was different from this, in this crisis from the previous ones is that uh, all international institutions and, uh, and also national authorities were more active. They reacted faster and uh, sizable and also were more coordinated. So uh, compared to the financial crisis that uh, was a, de a decade ago, uh, the world seems was much more prepared to react. So I'm optimistic on this, as the Prime Minister announced today, the, the, opti the, the good news about the end of the crisis uh, in the second quarter showing a positive GDP growth. I'm also optimistic that globally uh, we are creative, uh, I mean as humans, not just as a government, not understanding, misunderstanding. In general, as humans, we are, have been proving that uh, through the evolution and revolution, we have been very creative. So, uh, saying this, I'm trying to thank once again this uh, hybrid participation from other uh, panelists who are on the screen still with us. So it's not video, it's they are on screen with us all the time. Just want to thank also them, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I join you, of course, in thanking all the panelists. Uh, great contributions. Uh, I think a lot of inspiration. So, and uh, we will have uh, today in the afternoon and tomorrow uh, space also for more discussion. So um, mm, I wish all of you a uh, mm, interesting continuation of participating in this conference. Uh, stay safe stay healthy and stay optimistic. So uh, uh, all the best uh, to you and for those here in the room here in the now and in the here, uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>